Hi, I'm Jason Sheeler, Deputy West Coast Editor at People Magazine and Co-Chair of Outspoken. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this year's first Critical Conversation, a series of panel discussions focusing on important issues impacting our LGBTQ community. Today's talk will be about the millions of LGBTQ persons currently displaced around the world and how ORAM, the Organization for Refuge, Asylum, and Migration, is helping with this indeed critical issue. I know of ORAM's work, I know of ORAM's work because I know their executive director personally, and we have featured ORAM in the pages of People Magazine. And my co-chair, Andres Gutierrez, and I are excited about today's event. But instead of me explaining what ORM does before we begin, I found someone who has worked with ORM firsthand and was, in fact, an LGBTQ plus refugee. You'll know her from Pose. Hi, everyone. I am Dominique Jackson, and this is my fiance, Edwin Torres. Hi, everyone. We are here today to tell you about this organization that is very near and dear to our hearts, ORM. ORM, the Organization for Refugee, Asylum, and Migration. ORM is a nonprofit that helps LGBTQ refugees around the world who are escaping persecution and violence because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. They help them lead safe and empowered lives wherever they are along their journey. I feel a personal connection to Aurum's work and to the LGBTQ refugees they serve because I identify with so many of their challenges. I faced incredibly horrific, traumatizing situations as a young person in my home country of Trinidad and Tobago. I came to the U.S as an immigrant and for a time was both undocumented and homeless, facing even more racism and transphobia. But I persisted and stayed true to myself. And eventually I built this life that I'm living today. I see that same authenticity and drive in the amazing refugees that Aurum serves. So when their executive director, Steve Roth, approached me last year about appearing at one of their virtual events, I had to say yes. We were so moved and inspired by these incredible individuals facing such tremendous odds that we wanted to do something special for the community. So last year, we made a donation to Aurum to provide hot home-cooked dinners on Christmas Day to 200 members of the LGBTQ refugee community in Nairobi, Kenya. It was such a great experience that we came back and did it again this year for how many, babe? 300. 300 people. This is truly an amazing community of strong and resilient and inspiring individuals, but they need our support now more than ever. We hope that you'll check out Aurum at www.aurumrefugee.org or on social media. Please get involved and support their work. It's a great cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jason, for the introduction uh, and for bringing this to Outspoken. Today, we have Steve Roth, who is Executive Director of Orem, a pioneering organization working for the protection of exceptionally vulnerable LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers. He leads the organization's strategic development in conjunction with its board of directors. He directs their programmatic work development and communications. And he also oversees operations and partner relations. In other words, he's very busy. Prior to that, Steve served as Senior Director of Global Initiatives at Out and Equal Workplace Advocates, where he led the organization's efforts to advance LGBTIQ workplace inclusion globally. He launched a successful global fellowship program and produced major global workplace inclusion events in India, Brazil, China, and Eastern Europe. Previously, he served as founding executive director of Alturi, a nonprofit whose mission is to educate and engage Americans on global LGBTIQ issues. In 2008, he founded OutThink Partners, a boutique communications, marketing, and advocacy organization specializing in the LGBTIQ market. And he has also worked in various roles in the travel industry, at Atlantis, we all know those infamous cruises, and at United Airlines. Steve graduated from the University of Chicago in Latin American Studies and speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and Japanese. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for being with us today. 
So first question for you, what does Orem do and why is it important for all of us to have this critical conversation and learn about the refugee crisis? Well, great questions, Andres. And um, first, I just want to say a quick thank you to you and uh, to Jason and to Outspoken for, uh, for inviting me today and really creating this platform um, for organizations to discuss uh, critical, uh, have these critical conversations with you and your colleagues. Um, so here at ORM, we are the oldest international nonprofit focused exclusively on the safety and empowerment of LGBTIQ refugees uh, globally. Um, we both support refugees where they are on their journeys, um, because the, the truth is uh, most folks are somewhere in transit uh, between their countries of origin and a resettlement country like the U.S. And so uh, we help them along their journeys through programs like uh, economic empowerment and micro business development programs uh, and uh, leadership development. And we also help them on the move as they're trying to get to the, the, the country's uh, resettlement through our legal programs and mentoring and skills development and, uh, and advocacy work. And we also do work to, uh, to better engage corporations on LGBTIQ refugee issues. Um, so we're really glad to be able to have this opportunity to, uh, to speak with all of you today. And, and why is it important to have this critical conversation now? Well, uh, there are over 80 million displaced people globally, and that number is growing. And among that are millions of LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers, and they're really some of the most vulnerable uh, of all refugees. If you can imagine, uh, you know, think for a, a minute how challenging it can be uh, to be uh, gay or lesbian, let alone trans or queer, intersex, even in the United States, let alone in a country where you can be persecuted or even put to death uh, for your sexual, based on your sexual orientation or gender identity. And, um, LGBTIQ refugees face discrimination across so many identity lines. So discrimination, not only based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, but often their race, their country of origin, maybe the language they speak or don't speak. Um, and they travel alone as well, by and large, whereas most refugees and asylum seekers are with their families and with their communities. These are often the, the people that LGBTIQ people uh, are trying to escape. Um, and, you know, given on top of the kind of the numbers uh, and uh, you know, the daunting circumstances, the fact is that today uh, our border, our Southern border is still closed to asylum seekers under Title 42, um, which was a policy put in place under the previous administration. Um, the uh, Migrant Protection Protocols, MPP, or Remain in Mexico was just reinstated by the courts under court order, um, requiring asylum seekers to actually wait in dangerous Mexican border towns um, while their asylum cases are adjudicated. And uh, even though the Biden administration has made some strong commitments to resettling 125,000 refugees, uh, those, that work really hasn't started in great numbers and it's still really only a fraction of a percent of the total number of displaced people. And you know, finally, the places where LGBTIQ refugees are waiting, the places where we work, are incredibly dangerous and difficult for them. So it's, uh, it's really a, a critical and urgent uh, topic that I think we all need to be talking about and bringing more attention to. Yeah, uh, that's really important. And as you say, it's really critical for all of us to be educated on. So thank you for shedding a little bit more light on that. Um, now, before we continue any further, uh, could you please explain to our viewers today, what is the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker? Sure, uh, it's a good question. And I think there are terms that often get interchanged and there, there is a, an important distinction. So a refugee is someone who's been forced to flee their country of origin. Um, and the, the status, refugee is actually a, a specific status that is awarded by a, a country's government or by uh, the United Nations. And it's based on, um, they must have a demonstrated well-founded fear of persecution in their home country. And it's based on a number of different categories like race, religion, uh, political opinion, uh, but also um, there's a category called membership of a particular social group. And that's where um, LGBTIQ folks uh, fit. So um, this, was all, this was all established under a UN convention, the 1951 Geneva Convention. On the other hand, asylum seekers are uh, people who are, uh, are seeking asylum but have not yet received that refugee status. And so um, they can be somewhere along their journey or for example, sometimes asylum seekers have reached the US and have requested 
uh, asylum status, but uh, but haven't been given that yet. So that's an asylum seeker. Great. I myself did not know the difference uh, until recently when we first spoke. So thank you for educating me on that as well. Um, I know Oren recently published a groundbreaking report from a trip to Kenya that you guys took. Um, and we're gonna put some links in the chat for everyone to um, reference. Many of us, myself included, are so caught up in local news that we forget the gravity of these issues abroad. Can you please share the state of LGBTIQ refugees in Kenya in particular? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned it. I'm sure uh, a lot of folks have probably heard of um, the huge challenges that face LGBTIQ people in countries like Uganda, a country that considered a kill the gay bill, kill the gays bill that, um, that still criminalizes same sex relations. Well, Kenya is only one of only two countries in, in the entire continent of Africa that will even accept an asylum seeker or a refugee on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, but so it's a, it becomes, uh, it's become a focal point for, for queer asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, but that said, it's still not a, a safe place or a welcoming place to be. Um, Same-sex relations are still criminalized there and uh, folks really face a lot of challenges. So we did, uh, we spent a lot of time um, conducting a, uh, a, a re uh, some research there and publishing a report on the challenges facing LGBTIQ refugees, in particular in a, a massive refugee camp in the north of Kenya. And just to throw out a few statistics, uh, over 90% of respondents um, reported having been verbally insulted uh, based on their, uh, their sexual orientation, gender identity. 83%, imagine this, 83% reported being denied services in a shop because they were LGBTIQ. Uh, and nearly 90%, 88% reported uh, being denied police assistance uh, due to their sexual orientation, gender identity. Just incredibly high levels of uh, discrimination and violence that people face. That's in the refugee camp. Um, there's also a large population of urban refugees that we work with in Nairobi. And uh, those, in fact, are, are some of the ones that, that Dominique and her husband have gotten very close to and uh, have supported through some of their, their generous contributions. And um, while they're not in that immediate violence and danger of the camp, they also face a lot of lack of resources, um, job opportunities are legally not allowed to work in Kenya. Uh, discrimination is rampant, again, based also on their, their nationality as well as their gender, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, on the plus side, though, uh, you know, there is some positive. We've, uh, we've been working intensively in Kenya for about two and a half years, and um, some of our programs, particularly these micro-business programs, economic empowerment programs, are really starting to take off. We're seeing people are having skills, um, gaining skills, and uh, it, it's really having a positive impact on their mental health as well. Um, folks are learning how to organize and advocate for themselves. And we've even launched something really unique and different a, uh, through a partnership with a foundation that works in um, cryptocurrency and blockchain. We've rolled out a universal basic income program in the, uh, the refugee camp in Northern Kenya that we're piloting with LGBTIQ refugees where every day they're getting uh, the equivalent of a dollar in cryptocurrency that they're able to then trade or use or cash out. And um, it's really an exciting program for getting hands and uh, cash in the hands of uh, people that need it. So, you know, we have some, we have some bright spots uh, in our work there, but it is a very difficult uh, circumstance overall and definitely encourage people to check out our uh, report if they have a chance. Uh, what an enlightening experience. Um, I know that you sort of alluded to this before, but I just wanted to remind folks like in 70, 72 countries, same-sex relationships are currently criminalized. In fact, in eight countries, they're punishable by death. With that said, could you please share how have US policies towards LGBTIQ refugees changed or stay the same with the new US administration? Sure, uh, well, it's been a, a mixed bag at best, um, you know, I will say the administration came in and it's been, you know, exactly a year since um, since uh, President Biden took over. And uh, on a policy level, um, the change has been very dramatic and very positive in terms of um, policies that are uh, overall more welcoming and inclusive of LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers. Um, the previous administration had really shut down, um, kind of taken away the welcome mat for refugees. And we were welcoming less than 15,000 
refugees a year, if you can imagine out of that number of, you know, 80 million displaced people uh, was virtually nothing. So uh, the Biden administration announced a year ago that um, that we would be accepting as a country a total of 125,000 refugees per year, which is a big increase. It's still, again, just a drop in the bucket. And they have indicated that LGBTIQ refugees will be um, a, a, a target group or a, a priority group for protection because of their particular vulnerabilities. So that's a plus, um, but it's taken, you know, it's still taking a long time for those policies to be put into effect and for um, that resettlement to happen. And there are some moves now um, for uh, for this to, to start more, but again, it's, um, it, it's very slow. And uh, sadly, things at the border um, are, are uh, still worse. There, there's really not been a, a much improvement. Again, a lot of uh, you know, and I, I hate to say it, a, a lot of talk that, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to change policies, but at the end of the day, the, uh, the current administration has kept um, the Title 42 uh, restrictions in place. And what that was, was um, the previous administration used the COVID pandemic uh, as an excuse to close the border entirely to asylum seekers on, under the, the pretext of public health. Um, you know, at a time when, uh, for much of that time, the U.S. was the global epicenter of COVID. Uh, so, it was, you know, it, it, we weren't, it's not, we weren't keeping COVID out, you know, um, and uh, that policy, sadly, is still in place. And so it's been it's dramatically limited the ability of, of uh, asylum seekers at the border to enter the U.S. And, you know, we do a lot of work in Tijuana. Um, there are thousands of LG, LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers from all over the world, but in, in particular from Central America and in particular, in particular trans women. So El Salvador and Honduras have the highest murder rates in the world for trans women. And so people are leaving because they're seeing their sisters uh, get killed. You know, they're being threatened by government officials and attacks, sometimes killed by their own family members. And so it's a really dramatic situation. And then to get to the uh, US-Mexico border and being a city like Tijuana or Ciudad Juarez, which has one of the highest murder rates in the world, uh, is, uh, is not a great place to be. And uh, you know, as I mentioned before, not only is Title 42 in place, but uh, MPP or the Remain in, Pex in Mexico policy, which the Biden administration did want to remove, has unfortunately been reinstated uh, by the courts. It was challenged in, in the courts in Texas. And so what that policy says is that, um, again, that anyone who's seeking asylum in the US rather than waiting in the US for their case to be processed has to wait in Mexico. And so we're back to that same same situation we were facing before. And even if do if uh, folks do make it in, uh, detention centers in the US can be an extremely uh, dangerous and challenging place for LG LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers, and particularly trans asylum seekers. They're basically prisons. Um, folks are often uh, misgendered or they're, you know, they're housed in facilities um, not according to their gender identity. Um, but uh, you know what they were identified as as birth and um, and uh, so it's still you know it's still a really challenging situation and the changes unfortunately are not happening fast enough so there's um, there there are there's uh, improved attitudes towards um, LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers but uh, not enough change happening fast enough unfortunately yeah um, and that is why it's important to continue these conversations and get educated on it. And I know you touched upon this, but the pandemic has affected us all in various ways. And selfishly, you know, we probably complained about mass mandates, but, you know, could you tell us a little bit more in terms of the negative impact the pandemic has had on these refugees? I know you just touched upon it a little bit more, but oftentimes I, you know, I personally perceive that it used to be more from Central America, especially for LGBTIQ, or you know, or or Haiti or Cuba, but it seems like we've had like an influx of a lot more other countries coming, trying to come in and seek refuge, you know, refugee status through Mexico. Is that also been a part of like you know the pandemic and the borders being closed and not open to people just being able to fly in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, if you think about folks that are that are somewhere along the migrant journey, whether they're waiting, you know, at the border in in Mexico, in a place like Tijuana, or if they're in a refugee camp in Kenya, or even living in um, 
in safe houses, uh, people by and large, asylum seekers and refugees live a lot more closely together. You know, they're in camps, sometimes they're in tents or they're in shelters or in safe houses. So social distancing is more difficult, um, uh, particularly in the early phase of the pandemic. Uh, resources are, are just a lot more limited. Access to healthcare is really challenging. Um, you know, the way I like to think of it is, uh, LGBTIQ refugees and asylum seekers are really kind of the bottom people on the ladder and, uh, you know, the first to get pushed off when uh, when anything happens. Um, often also there's a, a higher number of people with uh, HIV and so more compromised immune systems. Again, discrimination in the healthcare systems, we see that a lot, but of course, much lower vaccination rates. Um, and then it has an impact on people's kind of mental health and well-being. Um, of course, there's just, you know, when uh, with, with all these conditions facing people, it ends up that, that oftentimes the only way that shelters can deal with it is um, just kind of lock people down. So there's a lot of less movement, less interaction, less chance for contact with the outside world. Uh, you know, we talked about these great uh, uh, micro businesses and job development programs we do. Um, you know, when the economy shuts down, again, it of course impacts the people that are, that uh, have, you know, that are at the bottom of the, the economic totem pole as well. Uh, you, you know, talked a lot about how the, the border just uh, was closed down full stop under Title 42 due to the, the pandemic. And it was also, of course, um, and this has started to change a little bit, but for the first year and a half of the pandemic, again, there was, uh, as, as you pointed out, Andres, no movement or resettlement for refugees, you know, under the under the pretext that, um, that people couldn't travel because of, of uh, COVID. And so, you know, even now is uh, in some ways and places trying to, to come out of it a little bit, you know, um, all the challenges that affect, uh, a lot of the challenges, at least, that affect us uh, as a society uh, impact the refugees as well, such so as global supply chain issues. Now, you know, I was just in Kenya, and, you know, we're, we're, we've got a number of uh, small poultry farms that we're, that we're helping to support, and, you know, the, their price for feed has gone up, which impacts their business and their ability to, wait to, to support themselves. So um, it's just, you know, that that uh, trickle-down effect hits, uh, hits LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers just as hard. Yeah, 100%. My heart truly breaks for them. Um, I'm just going to have two more questions, but I want to ask like, for the viewers to start submitting their questions into the chat or the Q&A. We'll leave uh, a few minutes um, at the end. We're mindful that this is a 30-minute chat, um, so please start trickling those in. Um, I recently read that the founder of Chobani, Hamdi Ulukai, I hope I pronounced it right, um, was once a refugee, and he has said that once a refugee gets a job, that's the moment they stop being a refugee. Now, that quote personally struck me as an immigrant myself. So on that note, can you please share what organizations help these refugees in the US after they are able to come into our country? For sure, and that's actually a great example and a, a great organization to flag. So uh, Hamdi, uh, who is Kurdish, Turkish himself and has a, a real connection to, to refugees, um, founded a, a, a nonprofit called the Tent Partnership for Refugees, and they're all about uh, connecting the corporate sector with refugees and, you know, promoting inclusion for refugees in the workforce. And so they do a, a really great job supporting people once they've been resettled to a place like the U.S. They actually hired us to write an entire guide on um, mentorship programs for LG, LGBTIQ refugees, uh, which we can uh, get the link for you for that as well. And then there are some LGBTIQ specific organizations that do work providing legal support, such as immigration equality is a big one that's been around for a long time. Santa Fe Dreamers Project does a lot more border focused work in that area. And then a lot of the, uh, the local and regional LGBTIQ community centers um, also have great services for refugees and asylum seekers here in LA. It's the LA LGBT Center. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of cities have similar organizations. Thank you. Um, okay, so for our viewers today, let's summarize a bit. Imagine having to flee your own country because of being persecuted for who you are and for who you love. Imagine reaching XYZ country and being locked up in a detention center at constant risk of being assaulted. Imagine having to restart your life in set foreign country, in poverty, 
and add to that the risk of being sexually exploited. Studies show that LGBTIQ migrants are among the most vulnerable, more likely to be assaulted and killed. 88% were victims of sexual and gender-based violence in their countries of origin. That is the reality of LGBTIQ refugees across the world. This is a crisis and we urge you all to help. Steve, please share with us, how can Dot Dash Meredith employees help starting today? And before I do that, I did want to surprise you with, um, we're going to donate to ORM $10 for each of the attendants of this conversation. So thank you to all that attended. Um, you know, we are really excited to be able to contribute in some way to, uh, to ORM, but obviously um, it doesn't end here. So Steve, let us know how else we could continue to help. Well, that's huge. And thank you so much for that, Andres, and to the entire uh, outspoken group and to, to Meredith Corp. Um, you know, we really appreciate that support. And, you know, I, of course, I'd be remiss without saying that's, that that's um, something that everyone can do today if you're interested in supporting um, our work, whether it's a donation of $10 or $25 or Hundred dollars of your own um, to to supplement the great donation that um, that Meredith is making. Uh, we we do have some uh, volunteer opportunities. It really depends because our work is so uh, is so global. It, you know, it's not like kind of a soup kitchen where you can show up. But people that have uh, specialized skills sometimes in things like uh, communications. Uh, you know, we do work with pro bono attorneys. Um, that is certainly something that. Um, that, that we're always open to. And, um, and one of the best things, and this is probably particularly in, in your all's wheelhouse, given you, the industry you work in, is really helping us spread the word about who we are and the work that we do. Um, uh, you know, these conversations are so important. Um, anything that you can do to amplify um, our work and the voices of the the LGBT, LGBTIQ refugees that we serve. And again, um, the publications have been great about doing that already, um, but that's uh, that's something that we always love and welcome. Um, we're on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at ORM Refugee. Uh, I think our website is in the chat there. And then also if, uh, if you all collectively as an employee resource group are interested in uh, in a, a broader partnership. This is something that we do with corporations as well. And um, that can include things like mentorship opportunities. We design mentorship programs, virtual workshops and things like that, um, or spy, pride specific programming. You know, a lot of organizations do do things around pride. If there are you know, ways to partner or collaborate, we're always open to that and, uh, and welcome that as well. So a lot of different ways to engage as, uh, in as much as, or as little as people want to. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that we just had come in, it's actually has a bunch of questions. So I'll try to summarize it a little bit for you, Steve. Um, how many US donors do, do you have and how many non-US non donors, more or less? Um, and then they're asking, um, given individuals or family foundation, I'm sorry. So the, sorry, the other question is, do you have difficulty getting women or men to female or bi or trans women to do public speaking? Do they need extra public speaking training? Um, I know given extra violence that they have many fears, love the trainings by Safe Place International. I think that's where um, they mentioned they work. Like, do you all collaborate? Yeah, so a um, couple of different questions I heard there. One in terms of uh, how many donors we have and where do they come from? Um, our individual donors are in the, the hundreds, which I'm proud to say, and that's a number that's grown a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, the vast majority of them are in the U.S. I would say probably 90 to 95 percent. You know, we're a U.S.-based 501c3, although we are also incorporated in Germany and we have an office there. Um, we a, a lot of our support also does come from uh, from foundations and uh, and increasingly from uh, from corporate supporters as well. Uh, and, and then the other question I think was about, uh, about uh, having uh, women and, um, and trans and non-binary speakers. We actually did a great um, program uh, with refugees and asylum seekers in Tijuana about a year ago it was a, a digital storytelling course where we brought in experts, actually journalists and filmmakers and photographers to, um, to really help build the capacity of uh, queer refugees and asylum seekers to tell their own stories and to be 
advocates um, and, and voices for their own work. So, you know, we're, we're ourselves a very small organization with just a staff of four. Uh, and, uh, you know, I run the organization, of course, uh, but we, you know, we are doing a lot to, uh, again, to, to help put those tools in the hands of the people that we support. But if there are folks that have particular interest in that, we'd love to hear. And, uh, you know, maybe there's, we can find some ways to work together. Awesome. Um, so we're out of time and we will respond to um, other questions to so some of the folks that attended. So we will get back to you, but we want to be very mindful of everyone's time. So thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Jason, for bringing this to us. Um, and thank you, uh, Daniel, our DNI team, for all your help. Um, I hope you guys found this informative. Um, and um, hopefully, you took down um, the, the URLs that were sent in the chat for you to learn more about Orem and um, this refugee crisis. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>